Mohan Rohadi and Mr. V.C. Matthews as our esteemed speaker. Thank you all for joining us today in this session class. Mr. Rohan is the founder and principal at RSR Legal Advocates and specializes in intellectual property laws, media and entertainment laws, information technology laws, among others. He advises clients ranging from startups to multinational corporations. He has expertise in handling all aspects of prosecution, litigation and enforcement, which are related to trademarks, copyrights, patents and designs. Over the years, he has represented clients and has appeared in courts all over India in trademark, copyright, disparagement, as well as design matters, and has also appeared in matters relating to winding up anti-suit injunctions, commercial recovery suits, among others. He has experience in criminal enforcement and customs, as well as drafting complex agreements. He has an experience of over 11 years and is a member of the Delhi High Court Bar Association and the International Trademark Association, INTA. Mr. Rohatki is currently serving as the Vice Chair of the in Indigenous Rights Committee at INTA. He holds a Master's Degree in Law from Queen Mary University of London with a specialization in intellectual property right laws, arbitration and commercial litigation. Mr. Matthews is a Managing Associate with Intel Advocates and has extensive experience of around 12 years in trademark, copyright and design prosecution and handles both Indian and international clients. His practice focuses focuses on advising on all aspects of trademark, copyright, and design prosecution, including clearance searches, application strategic development, and management of worldwide trademark, copyright, and design portfolios. With prior experience in handling matters in the contentious and non-contentious field, his experience and focus is to assist clients with commercial and holistic solutions to the numerous intellectual property problems. His experience has also led him to handle clients across various industries such as apparel, luxury, pharmaceuticals, FMCG, technology, and retail. Matthews regularly appears before the five trademark registries in India and has in-depth knowledge as to its working. Pursuant to completing his law from Symbiosis Law School in India, Matthews went on to complete his Master's in Intellectual Property Laws from Queen Mary University of London. Today's session class is on use of artificial intelligence in the practice of intellectual property law. This class is organized by LegitQuest, which is an artificial intelligence based legal research product. It is a state of the art legal research platform for conducting legal research and is very well known for the introduction of the world's only one click insight system called the iDraft case analytics. In short, the iDraft feature powered by artificial intelligence takes out the issue, facts, arguments, reasoning and decision of a case law. LegitQuest recently has also started with LegitI, which is latest news, interviews and columns and serves the stakeholders of judiciary. Our today's session will be for 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I would request all our participants to be on mute and without video throughout the call. And all questions to the speakers can be written in the chat box. This should be taken at the end of the session, if the time permits. I would now hand over it to Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Tulip. Uh, Karan, Legit Quest, thank you so much for having us over. Um, I'm just going to share my screen at uh, the outset. Yep. Right. So today we have a very, very interesting topic uh, at hand here. Um, it's the use of in artificial intelligence in intellectual property law. When we think of AIs, I go back to my childhood. There was this one movie which captured the imagination of literally everybody who watched it and it's become a cult movie. That movie happened to be Terminator. And you see Arnold Schwarzenegger walking around with robots running around. AI kind of made a major, major impact on the big screen and was just out there at that particular point of time. You know, that's one of the biggest moments that I, as a young boy, can relate to when I talk about artificial intelligence. But what is artificial intelligence? So while there is no universal definition, AI is generally considered to be a disciple of or a discipline of computer science that is aimed at developing machines and systems that can carry out tasks considered to require human intelligence. Now, here is a very, we have a very uh, unique definition and the media today states that AI could replace us as human beings. That seems to be a big, big, big fear. I disagree with that analogy because I believe that AI is more of an assistive system which will assist us human beings. It cannot replace us. So machine learning and deep learning, these are two subsets of AI. 
And in recent years with development of new neural networks and techniques, AI is now coming to become a very, very, very important tool which one must know as a lawyer and maybe adapt in the future to our ways of working. So before we go you know, even further into the topic or delve into the topic, we need to understand a little bit of history about the entire thing because we need to understand what happened in the past to know what's there in the future for us. So AI is not a very recent term. It, it was formed in 1956 actually. Dartmouth College, and there was a conference there, and they came up with this very, very intelligent term called artificial intelligence. 1962, 66 to 72, that was a time where the Stanford Research Institute took up the uh, mantle, and they came out with a robot called Shaky for self reasoning. In 1997, you have another major, major impact where IBM developed the Deep Blue computer, which went on to defeat the then chess champion. Gary Kasparov. 2006, the companies that we now relate to, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Netflix, they also started using AI in a very, very, very limited capacity. 2020, uh, 2008, Google launched their assistant, or Google Assistant. Subsequently, Apple launched their assistant called Siri. Both of these are, in a way, AIs as well. 2018 and 2020, you have a lot of talk happening on AIs. You have IBM coming up with Project Debater, which debates on a lot of complex human topics. And then in 2020, you have WIPO having a public consultation on the process of artificial intelligence and the intellectual property policy. Now, the papers related to WIPO are easily available on the, WIPO, on the website and are actually a wonderful read, which I believe Rohan will be taking up very, very shortly. So Rohan, over to you. Thank you, Matthews, for uh, the introduction on AI. And firstly, thank you, Tula, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, Karan and LegitQuest, for having us over. And I hope everyone's uh, keeping safe at this time. So uh, going forward from where uh, Matthews uh, left us, uh, we are going to be dwelling into the international developments, the policy developments vis-a-vis -vis AI and IP, and then the developments in India. So WIPO, uh, way back in 2018, had started uh, consultations with uh, the various member states to understand how the IP administration in all these uh, countries, which are their respective patent and trademark offices, how they really use AI for uh, improving their efficiency and their uh, internal systems like examination and search. From there, uh, you know, the WIPO uh, realized that uh, there is a lot of use uh, of AI around the world. And uh, therefore, last year in 2019, January, uh, a conversation started on uh, IP and AI, which dwelled into various aspects. Now, uh, they came out with an issues paper, which is subsequently revised after each session. As recently as July 2020, they had the second session on the issues in relation to uh, AI and IP. Now, there are interesting observations uh, when you go through that revised paper, which is available on the WIPO website. Now, we are only going to be dealing with the aspect in relation to the IP administration and not dwelling into the aspects in relation to uh, who is the owner of a, uh, an invention uh, when it's being done by a AI. As you would have recently heard, there was there was a case in the US where the USPTO refused uh, the uh, patent because the inventor was an artificial int intelligence, uh, not an individual. And that has recently been appealed by the humans who filed on behalf of the AI. So that would be an interesting development, but that's a conversation for another time. Uh, going back to where the uh, issues paper, what the issues paper dealt with was a VIP administration. The various countries like Australia, Canada, EU, Korea, Singapore, you know, which have put into practice a lot of these uh, AI softwares, which could assist them with examination, classification, image search, prior art search, translation, data analysis, and so on and so forth. 
and uh, this is something which is an ongoing uh, development around the world now what has wipo been doing all through uh, with ai is what is more interesting at the international level so if you if you look up at the, at the wipo website there are around five tools which uh, use ai as a subset to provide uh, assistance to either the examiners or the lawyers or the applicants directly now one of these uh, is the wipo translation where which primarily deals with uh, <clears throat> patents and assists uh, the patent examiners assist the patent applicants or the lawyers to translate from one language to another without much of a trouble and this has recently been opened up for other avenues as well on a license fee model but it's an interesting development and one of the oldest tools that wipo has been using vis a vis uh, ai the other tool that they use is a wipo brand image search which is a part of the wipo brand uh, global database uh, which is usually used for trademarks now initially you could not do image searches on wipo you, you could do uh, text searches you could do uh, searches through vienna classification but you could not do a search of an image but in the last few years they have developed systems where you could uh, put in images and actually get uh, the results which not only are on the basis of uh, the color or the mark it's also on the texture so these are very interesting developments and this is uh, a very recent development at wipo they have really improved the systems on the global brand database the next uh, and a very recent development has been the vienna classification assistant which was launched very early in august i think it was august 5th where uh, the you can go onto a wipo website and uh, put in the image which would help you in uh, getting the vienna classification automatically now this was not the case earlier and that was usually done manually now through this vienna classification assistant you could find out the exact classification which could also help you in carrying out an image search on local databases in your respective countries apart from that there are two more uh, wipo ai models which uh, one of them is the wipo speech to text which was uh, primarily used for the meetings and conferences at wipo and was developed specifically for that uh, where uh, all the audio and uh, all the the videos were converted into text for uh, reference purposes i understand that it's being used uh, a lot now at the united nations and wipo and other international bodies and now even this is available uh, on uh, a license basis from wipo the they also have a very old system which dealt with patent classification and uh, which is developed uh, a lot from its earlier times and still uses a lot of artificial intelligence tools so these are primarily the administration uh, tools that wipo provides at the international level to member states to lawyers to applicants uh, which assist in uh, carrying out searches in assistance in filing applications and so on and so forth now uh, there are various tools developed all across the world and matthews will deal them deal with them in detail at a later point of time now they, these are usually the international developments because of the ip the various other developments taking place in uh, other uh, intra governmental organizations which uh, might not relate to ip but unesco is for example coming out with a paper on uh, ai and ethics so uh, that's not the part of the conversation here but just for uh, the knowledge of everyone now this was in relation to what's being happening internationally now uh, there are various developments in a lot of the countries uh, now we are, we'll be dealing ex uh, specifically with india in relation to developments vis-a-vis uh, -vis ai and ip so though there has been no specific application of ai in the indian ip offices however uh, way back in 
there was an expression of interest uh, that was uh, called out from the Indian Patent Office where they wanted to uh, put AI and other big data uh, technologies into use in uh, processing of from filing of applications to internal processings till uh, registrations. Uh, that is, I understand, still in progress, but uh, it's it's early days to comment on how it's really going to assist the IPO. Now, uh, going on to the policy space uh, in the national IPR policy 2016, there was no mention. There's no specific mention of uh, use of artificial intelligence, but the intent is to use uh, the most recent and most updated versions of ICT to assist the uh, trademark office, the copyright office, the patent office, designs office, and all the other IP offices that are there in the country. So there is uh, an intent from the government to use AI for purposes of prosecution of IP and to ease the process and thereby also uh, the timelines getting much better and also the examinations, uh, the results improving. So that is what has been happening at the IP level. However, there have been certain other developments which would also be uh, having an impact on the uh, IP aspect. Now, uh, way back in 2018, uh, METI, which is the Ministry of Electronic Electronics and Information Technology constituted uh, commit four committees on AI. And uh, those reports were made available last year and they're available on the METI website for all to view. Some of the interesting uh, developments that took place uh, is that there is a huge focus uh, of the government uh, on, the, on AI and hence the committee reports. Now, these four committees came out with their reports and have established a national AI portal, which gives you all the information vis-a-vis -vis AI. Vis-a-vis -vis the legal uh, field, which is the judiciary, there have been uh, certain recent developments which were also noted in these commission reports. One of them being use of translation uh, softwares by the judiciary to convert the English judgments into vernacular languages. So as far as uh, 2000, uh, early 2020, the Supreme Court has launched uh, a lot of these uh, softwares on their website where you could access uh, the judgments and the orders in vernacular languages. I, I understand that's still a work in uh, progress. Now, apart from that, there are various other ways that uh, the AI can assist the uh, legal and the judiciary uh, field, which would help in the data analysis. Apart from these developments, there was also a development uh, where the Ministry of Corporate Affairs last year uh, has come out with uh, a software, which also is under development right now, where, wherein you could, uh, when you're choosing a company name, Initially, it would only look for a trademark name and would uh, not be taking out any difference between the fields of service or goods. With the new AI software, which is being tested by the NCA as per news reports, it could guide you onto also how the name is either phonetically uh, similar to an existing trademark and if it's different from the services or goods that a company uh, proposes to use. So these are some of the developments that have happened internationally and in India, and these are ongoing developments uh, as we speak. Uh, and that is uh, it from my end. I hand over again to Matthews to take it forward vis-a-vis uh, -vis the developments uh, in other countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rohan. So, <clears throat> Let's look at it from a perspective of India now and practice. As a lawyer today, I always find that some of the most important aspect is time. Time is of essence, it's billable, it's important to each and every one of us and AI somehow helps me as a practitioner, as a lawyer in ensuring that I use my time to the optimum. 
in our field of intellectual property rights, artificial intelligence plays a great role or can play a great role if we adapt and adopt to it in recent times. So if you look at trademarks, copyrights, designs, and patents, these are the basic main headings that I would like to discuss and you know, put thoughts into people's head as to how AI could help us. <laughs> Let's look at trademark law at the outset. Classification of goods, Rohan, you had referred to this, yes. And AI can effectively help in the classification of goods and services and help a person classify it as per the least classification. I often find clients coming and saying, how do I classify it? I understand like, I read the material and the literature online and I know that there's some form of classification which needs to be done. I've seen that there are 45 numbers. How do I rightly classify it? I've come across applications of clients which have been filed in the wrong classes an AI will be able to assist applicants if and when they want to apply in their own name <clears throat> and they can do it by themselves as per Indian trademark law. Now this tool that I'm proposing, it's not a tool which is new, it's already in existence in Australia, Singapore, Germany, and Japan. The trademark offices of these jurisdictions are currently using this system to help applicants and practitioners get the best classification and to be able to classify the mark in the right classes. Examinations. Often a complaint in Indian, amongst Indian lawyers and practitioners is, well, the mark does not seem to have been examined well, and this is atrocious. What form of examination has been done? It's true. There have been some really, really atrocious examinations which have happened as far as trademark law is concerned by the trademarks registry, and we can't deny that. Now, how can an AI help us here? <clears throat> For one, the AI could assist the examination officer to be able to determine and make the correct observation or the correct objection when he is examining a particular trademark. The same can be looked at when you see how the Singapore IP office has used what is known as A-star, yeah. which measures the distinctiveness of a given mark and also suggest evidence for the measurement of it. So Singapore has successfully done this to assist examiners to improve their efficiency of examination. Image searches. You had referred to Viana, the Viana codification, Rohan, when you were speaking, as well as the software that WIPO is offering. That's correct. WIPO came out with this really, really wonderful software for Viana codification. Though we are not codification searches are available on the Indian TMR website, many of us do not go to it and do it. Reason being the amount of time that it takes for one and the complexities associated with the codification. With a system like how the Australia IP offices uses, which is called trademark vision, or the one that EU IPO uses or the European Union Intellectual Property Office called TM vision, or even the one that WIPO has put forward on their website, one could actually upload an image and the AI would be able to tell the applicant or the person who's uploading the image, the correct codifications in which a search must be conducted. This will greatly help both applicants and practitioners in the practice of IP law and doing trademark searches in respect of images. India has the system, but if we adopt AI to it, we would be enhancing the system tenfold. Opposition proceedings. <clears throat> Often opposition proceedings are left to the subjectivity of uh, the hearing officer uh, in the end of the opposition proceeding at, at the hearing. The hearing officer after hearing both sides actually makes a decision as to the similarity between marks or goods and services. Now, if you look at A-Star, A-Star uses, used by IPOS, which is a Singapore IP office, actually is able to compare marks and assist the examiner or the hearing officer to determine the percentage of similarity which is there between both marks. This is where I had initially stated that AI will not replace us. On the contrary, it would act as an assistive tool. Imagine a system where you know, we go for a hearing today to the Indian Trademarks Registry for an opposition, and the officer is able to use AI to review the evidence that we have submitted and then come to a very objective uh, analysis when he passes his order as to why he believes A is similar to B. That is something that we can you know, dream of, but 
I'm telling you today, the dream can become a reality very, very soon in the next couple of years. Translation, Rohan, another thing that you referred to. Yes, marks in languages other than English are often required to be filed with relevant translations. Using an AI would definitely, definitely help try, uh, make, us, make these translations easy for both applicants as well as practitioners. And this is not a tool which is alien. EU IPU does actually use a multi-language tool called Babelscape for internal examiners. And I believe WIPO as well uses one which you had referred to in your uh, uh, talk some time ago. Patent law, always an uh, area of contention. Patent classification, just like the trademark classification, an AI could examine the contents of a patent and predict relevant technology groups, thus enabling the allocation to operate patent examiner sections. As we all know, patent law is very technical, so a guy doing Engineering may not understand biotechnology and vice versa. So it's important that the examination is done by a person who is an expert in that particular field and an AI could help do this. Brazil and Australia have been adopting such kind of technology for their examination process in respect of patents. Prior art search is something which is done before even a patent is uh, filed. An AI can use the text of an application to uh, do the prior art and tell you what is there outside and what is not there. Japan and Finland have been testing something like this, though they haven't adopted it. I've also been uh, not noted that a lot of private software companies have adopted AI technologies for prior art searches, which one can get for a particular fee. So th this is something that was uh, brought to my attention very recently when I started my research into this topic. Examination, just like we talked about examination or quality of examination improving with the use of AI for trademarks, the same can be said for patents as well. So an AI can examine patent, patent files for annotation of patent literature, detection of problems, solutions, and detection of exclusive exclusion from patentability. So the USPTO, which has been the forefront of adopting AI technology to their uh, processes, has something or an AI to determine the patentability of a patent, app, patent application, analyze it, and also issue office actions. So this, this is something which is really, really unique to the US Patent Office and one which can be adopted by even the Indian Trademark Registry today. Patent infringement suits. Now, law allows us, or rather law allows uh, experts to be appointed or called to testify in an infringement suit uh, for their technical knowledge so that the judge is able to may come to a conclusion after understanding what is at stake, what the technology is. The expert plays a role of an assistant here. He basically assists the judge to come to a, make a determination. What if an AI could do this? And why can't an AI do this? An AI could replace such experts and conduct that examination of the claims and give the data to the judge who would then be able to make an informed call on whether a patent has been infringed and if so, to what extent. Machine translation, Rohan, again, something that you had referred to. The WIPO translate uh, software or the AI which is there on the WIPO website is maybe one of the world's leading instant translation tools wherein you can translate patent documents to a large, large extent and, and it keeps learning the more you keep uploading onto it. And it's got on 18 language pairs. That's quite a lot. <clears throat> Designs and copyrights law. Now here, the amount or uh, the, uh, the amount of AI which is used in design and copyright law across the world is not as much as it is in trademark or patent law. Because I believe design and copyright law are still in infancy and are in, still getting developed. So, uh, you would, yes, you, we will see the adoption of AI in the future for designs and copyrights law. But for now, there is limited usage of the same as far as designs and copyrights are concerned. But the scope of using it in both designs and copyrights is very, very large. It's very, very large. A design search. Now, this is something that an AI could help an applicant or even the examiner with. He, the, the AI could examine it and to a, and, and look through a searches, uh, basically search through a series of images on the design register and hunt out similar designs and tell or inform the examiner as to the extent of the similarity as well. EU IPO uses 
something which is very, very similar to what I just explained right now. It's an image-based search for both trademarks as well as for designs. Copyright search and examination. <clears throat> So or rather let's, uh, let's do the design, so design examination. So like I said, like it helps in searches, it helps in examination as well. And it examines the parable parameters of registrability. Uh, though it, this is quite subjective because we will have to, or rather the AI will have to learn quite a lot to be able to determine one design uh, which is similar or dissimilar to another. So a lot of learning will have to go into ensuring that the AI is able to make a correct judgment call as regards uh, the comparison of two designs, because it might be a very, very simple thing, but it might change the design completely. And the AI would need to learn quite a lot for that purpose. Copyrights, copyright searches, examinations, exactly similar to designs. An AI can help conduct image searches for artistic works, especially to help determine the level of originality and creativity and in a, in a literary work as well. Now, I've often found um, cases in copy for copyright infringement where we have to determine the, the amount which has been copied. Or the question that lies in front of us is, has a substantive amount been copied or not? And if so, what is the amount which has been copied? What's the percentage like? What happens normally is that we pursue or purview the works and then make a determination and this determination may be subjective from one person to another. So I may say 20%, the other person may say 40%. So there could be a huge, huge, huge subjective element to determine how much has been copied, if copied at all. An AI could just knock out the subjective element and could be very, very accurate in determining the percentage of what has been copied. And this data could be assisting the judge or the person sitting to mediate or rule upon whether a copyright has been infringed or not. So this is kind of in a crux how AI could be used in practice of IP law today across various fields that are there and that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the basic thing that we will see across all of it is apart from being an assistive tool, the element of time it comes down substantially when one adapts and adopts to the usage of AI in the practice of law. <clears throat> now, Ron, you touched upon this, that you know, AI has been used internationally. There have been a lot of policies related to AI as well. And that's true because a lot of countries have started using it. It's not something which is theory anymore. It's being practically used. So just to give you a few examples, Australia, Japan, the European Union. These are three countries which are using AI and using it successfully to increase both their efficiency and reduce the time taken for a particular task. So like Australia is using for trademark examinations, for classification of goods and conducting image searches for patent classification. Whereas uh, Japan uses it for prior art searches and has also conducted tests to validate the possibility of using AI to respond to questions from users who access their website and even image searches, I might imagine. Well, the European Union has adopted image searches, the patent classification, the patent examination registrability as far as AI tools are concerned. WIPO again has a host of tools, which Rohan, you had mentioned, uh, five in all, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the United States, UK and Singapore, again at the forefront of using AI for practice for examinations, for image searches, for patent classifications, classifications as for the Vienna codification and so on and so forth. So what we are talking about is not a theoretical thing at all. It's actually being practically used and used across jurisdictions across the world. India, what's the scene in India like today? I mean, are we looking at a future with the use of AI? Definitely, we're, we're not looking at a future without it because Yes, though we have been lagging behind in the use of such tools, the Indian IPO had, as Rohan pointed out in 2018, had put out an expression of interest for using AI or blockchain and IoT technology in patent processing system. So it's, you, one can imagine that the trademarks, copyrights and designs divisions are not too far behind. There is an expression of interest within the CGT PTM for something <laughs> Yeah, the AI in the future. 
as far as steps are concerned, well, expression of interest is wonderful and great. What, what steps have been taken? Unfortunately, there haven't been many significant steps on the ground which have been taken in India to use AI in the examination or in the practical process uh, of our uh, working uh, in style in India. India definitely could benefit greatly from incorporating AI. Like I remember when I was when I started practice, the biggest complaint that foreign clients had was it takes so long in India to get a certificate of registration for a trademark. This used to be a common complaint. We have come miles forward from that particular statement today, where if you do not have an objection, something and no oppositions, you get a certificate of registration within a time period of six to eight months. That is very, very fast. That is maybe even faster than the USPTO today, if I'm not mistaken. So can AI even help us even further? Yes, definitely. It can improve our efficiency. It can improve the quality of examination. It can assist hearing officers to determine the uh, uh, similarity of the mark, the percentage of similarity. It can assist practitioners to determine what is registrable. That is something which clients often ask is, is my mark registrable? What is the level of registrability? We always analyze the searches and we give a very subjective number, 45%, 55%, 65%. It's a very subjective number. I say 65%, Rohan may say 62%, or he may say 55% for all you know. So it's a very subjective thing. We take the subjectivity out with the use of AI and it becomes a very objective test wherein the AI determines and gives us a percentage which greatly, greatly helps a client, an applicant to determine what can and cannot be done, what can and cannot be filed and for what and what is the rate of success. The advantages in conclusion, what are the advantages of using AI, which I just mentioned all throughout these uh, small presentations that we had? Make the system more user-friendly to the applicant. Law is something that today in India, we look at it and we say, oh, wow, that's very confusing. And AI will be able to make it easier for an applicant. In India today, an applicant, as far as trademark law is concerned, can actually file an application by himself. He does not need to go to a lawyer. He does not need to go to a law firm. But what happens is that he often makes mistakes because it's so confusing. It's not easy for a person who is a layman to understand it and do the filing by himself. Improve the efficiency and search of searches and results. This is something that is very, very, very much required. We do as practitioners have a lot of complaints as far as how the trademark registry does things. Uh, and we often put forward representations and we have done so in the past and we'll do so in the future as well to improve the efficiency. But that is something that AIs can definitely, definitely bring in. Reduce backlog and the pendency of matters. Now, this has been a consistent issue with the CGDPTM for years now. They have done quite a lot and kudos to them for having done so much, but there is still much to be done and the adaption or the adoption of new technologies would definitely help with that. Speed of examination process. Well, the current time period for trademark examination process is around a month. Uh, with the lockdown, I think it's, it's, it's been increased slightly a little bit more, but a month is what it was. Um, this can be even further reduced if we use AIs to assist the examination officers and also increase the efficiency of it, thus reducing the chances of human error. And it also provides objective analysis for and reduce such subjective bias, especially in matters which are contentious in nature and which need a determination by that one hearing officer in whose hands we place all our evidence and our submissions to. So in conclusion, is AI something that is scary? No. Is AI something that is useful? Definitely yes. And uh, will it help us in the future to, um, increase our efficiency and our knowledge and make it simpler for people to do work? Most definitely, yes. And I hope that in the future, we do see a lot of technology being uh, utilized to push forward the practice of law, the practice of law, um, and to take it to greater heights, especially in India and in the field of intellectual property. The scope is high and the sky is definitely the 
limit as far as that is concerned. Yeah. Tulip, over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. That was really helpful and insightful for all of us. Now we have received some questions that uh, we would put forth. Now the first question that we have received is that uh, what do you have to say about some of the barriers to the widespread deployment of AI-powered systems among IP offices? Sorry, Tulip, could you just repeat that again, please? Yeah, it says that uh, what do you have to say about some of the barriers to the widespread deployment of AI-powered systems among the IP offices? Yeah, so some of the barriers, I think the first barrier is, of course, a psychological barrier, which must be overcome uh, by people to be, uh, to have a, basically people, we as human beings have a closed mind when it comes to, you know, using of technology, especially new ones. Uh, I, I've seen this quite a lot, but may, uh, that is one of the first barriers that one needs to overcome. Subsequent to that, uh, an AI does take time. You know, it, it's not something that you just adapt immediately and it starts working flu, uh, flawlessly and it gets, uh, and you get start getting results with the hundred percent accuracy. It takes time for the AI to learn. So, Training the AI, you could, yeah, we could call it roughly training the AI is as important as using that. So that is maybe one of the biggest hurdles. And if IP officers do not have a plan as to how they're going to train it, how long it's going to take, what data they need to feed in to train the AI to be able to give them the optimum results that is required, then the entire thing would fail or the entire plan would fail. So overcoming that psychological barrier as far as human beings are concerned, that's one and definitely training the AI to be able to work at an optimum, that is definitely required. Thus, having an organized plan or a, or a two-year plan or a five-year plan for the utilization of AI is, is one that is definitely a must for IP offices. Okay, uh, thank you. Mr. Rohan, you would like to add something to this? Uh, just to add on to what uh, Matthew said, I think apart from these issues, the other issue that needs to be looked into is also the security aspect uh, and the ethics aspect which I think is still being uh, deliberated a lot. But, you know, ethically, we do not know how AI will act, uh, let's say, five years later. So uh, a lot of work is required on how the data is protected, how that is processed. And like Matthew said, human intervention is still required. AI cannot function without human intervention. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. The other question is that uh, how should one determine authorship and ownership of AI generated copyrighted works? Who will be liable in case of infringement, the user, instructor, or the AI itself? Good. So, uh, thank you for that question, Tulip. This is something which is still being deliberated, like I mentioned uh, during the policy developments. Uh, one of the questions that's still being answered is can uh, something developed by AI, can they be inventors? The uh, question based on the law today is no. But then these are developments which have shaken the whole system in terms of what were established principles of ownership and authorship are no more uh, true in today's time. So uh, this is something which needs to be looked into. It is not something which is very clear because uh, as the question that arises is if uh, I'm an author, right? AI could be an author because in all probability, they will be considered to be an employee of a company. So anything which uh, an employee develops is usually the ownership of that company. So uh, an AI maybe could be an author, but that would be again subject to local laws. However, ownership is something which I do not think in... Uh, as per the Bern Convention and the local IP laws, the local copyright laws, that an AI could be an owner of a work. However, uh, we will still need to deliberate if can they be an author or not. Matthew, Rohan, there's also, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was a monkey who took a selfie uh, recently using an AI and there was a whole issue regarding who actually had the rights uh, in that particular photograph. Uh, that, that's an interesting uh, quagmire as far as uh, AI was concerned. Uh, it's quite, I think it's called the monkey selfie matter. You can just uh, search on Google. I'm, I'm sure it's worked a lot of hits. But that, that was kind of the gist of the problems that one faces as far as determining uh, the author or the owner 
uh, in relation to AI is concerned. The law, I think, is very, it's still in its infancy, uh, and it will take some time, and there will be issues as far as ownership and authorship are concerned uh, to determine uh, who is the owner or author of something that is created by an AI. So uh, time will tell, actually, uh, and how the law develops and what forms of problems that we would have to face in the future is concerned. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for that. Now we have talked about patenting inventions. So what are the issues uh, that you would like to share with us regarding the patenting inventions developed using AI, such as those that may arise in the drug discovery context? Yeah, so um, I guess the same problem that Rohan had talked about regarding so let's say an AI does develops, uh, let's say it develops a vaccine for COVID today, right? uh, but the AI does belong to uh, XYZ company. Now, how does one determine who owns the patent rights in that particular drug or, or pharmaceutical product uh, when it is not created by the company, but rather it's created by an artificial intelligence being? The problem again arises, it's exactly similar to the owner author problem that we have in front of us today. Who is the owner of that particular patent? Can that AI file a patent? And if the AI can file a patent, is it something that, of course, patentability issues would arise? Yes, but can the question would be, can the AI or is the AI recognized as a person to be able to file the patent today? Or does the company to whom the AI belong belongs, file the patent. So th there is a whole issue as to ownership of something created by AI, which is going to happen. It's, it's not only really happening in copyright, it's going to happen across the fields uh, in patents as well. So the law on this is very, very undeveloped, like I just stated earlier. So it is only time which will determine what the answers that we will try to make to tackle these problems in the coming uh, months or years ahead. So Tulip today, it's, it's slightly difficult to be able to determine who owns the patent. Uh, and to the, uh, to the person who asked the question, if the answer is basically this, it's very difficult to determine who owns the patent today because there are issues much beyond that before we can decide who owns the patent, which needs to be resolved. Mr. Roadgi, you would like to add something to this? Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving forward on this COVID-19 issue, uh, the question is, will the compulsory licensing apply to the cure for COVID-19? If artificial intelligence is useful in future with regards to COVID, then the use for the world or public purpose would amount to any copyright violation. Right. So firstly, that would not be a copyright violation. This uh, totally falls under the purview of patent and drug law respectively. Uh, now, is there be a compulsory license? Yes, that can be issued by the government. That's totally uh, something upon the government, but I wasn't very clear with the question where, where exactly are they heading to in terms of can AI still be the owner of the inventor of the patent or what exactly is the question? Sorry, could you yeah, repeat that? AI yeah, I think AI being the owner of the patent and how would then it work? I think we go back to the same answer that Matthew's answered on the previous question. That is something difficult to answer at this point of time. This is something which is now sub judice in the US and it would be interesting to note what uh, the US courts hold on that. So uh, I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, we'll have to wait and watch. Mr. Matthews, you would like to oh, add it. Uh, thank you, Tulip. I think uh, I hold the same view as Rohan in this matter. Uh, and so uh, I, let's move on to the next question, Tulip. Sorry. Yeah, the next question is, will introduction of AI for examining trademarks be accompanied by changes to the trademark rules applicable to IP offices? I don't think it is required to change the rules. Um, the AI, we need to understand that we are going to use the AI or rather we are proposing to use the AI as, a, as an assistive tool. So today the examiner, let's say it's like a software, consider it as a software. One uses software for numerous purposes. 
So one is going to use, or rather the trademark office is going to use the AI as an assistive tool or a software in being able to make better judgment calls in respect of the objections which are being raised in the examination report. Thus increasing the one, the efficiency of the examiner and two, the quality of the examination which is being so no no change in the rules is required uh, in my opinion uh, as far as the law is concerned. What? No, no, so just to add on from what Matthew said, there's no uh, requirement of changing the law. The process remains the same. Uh, even today, they would be using a certain software to carry out those examinations. It's only an improvement in the current product. It's not there's no change in the process of examination or in the prosecution of a trademark application. Maybe there would be uh, requirements to amend their internal rules of uh, procedure and practice within the trademark office, but not vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the trademark law or the trademark rules. Okay. Over to you, Tulu. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, now the next question is, uh, how does the outbreak of COVID, uh, this pandemic, how does it bolster as well as undermine the TRIPS regime, especially copyright of the WTO, as use of AI becomes pervasive? Or do you want to take this on policy? Sure. Uh, Tula, could you repeat the last part? Sorry. Yeah, it says that how does uh, the outbreak of this pandemic bolster as well as undermine the TRIPS regime, especially copyright of the WTO, as use of AI becomes pervasive? To, uh, so from what I recall at this point of time, it uh, does not in any way undermine TRIPS. Uh, TRIPS was only uh, laying down certain uh, minimum standards vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the IP laws and the practice in those countries. And at that point of time, uh, AI and COVID probably were not even existent uh, during the uh, discussions on TRIPS. So uh, I do not think they're undermining, yes, but they do provide uh, provisions that we have discussed previously regarding compulsory licensing that countries could adopt. So TRIPS does lay down a minimum standard and there are provisions for uh, compulsory licensing, which one could, uh, which governments, let's say for example in India, could adopt to have uh, COVID being the COVID uh, medicines as the vaccines uh, as in when they're available to be manufactured and licensing being, you know, given to various companies. So those provisions do exist. And I don't think uh, COVID in any which way undermines trips. Uh, that is my view. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, uh, another question is, is copyright a casualty in the era of social media? In the future, is it possible for AI to get copyright over works autonomously generated by it? Do you want to go first or should I? <laughs> I'll go first. You can follow. Uh, so, uh, you know, just to lead on from uh, the presentation, uh, one should go through these uh, WIPO issue papers because these are, all, these are all issues that are being dealt with and there's no definitive answer for all these questions uh, in today's times. We need a whole change in policy. We need a whole change in laws to uh, really understand where we are going to be going. Uh, I understand what, what the, uh, the person asking the question is really intending to ask, but um, Matthew's over to you. <laughs> right. So, yeah, social media is a double-edged sword. That's what I always refer to. It. It's, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and uh, with social media, one can always say well, what you put out there uh, unfortunately has chances of A, getting uh, stolen, B, getting misused. Uh, so one needs to be careful as far as social media is concerned. Uh, AI, yes, the more it learns, the smarter it gets. Uh, can today AI become a threat uh, in the age of social media? It could, uh, but I don't believe it can. It, it, like we see a lot of these movies where we are, have a very negative connotation of AI. And I believe that is wrong. Uh, I myself uh, support for quite a lot of tech-based tech uh, softwares and, and things, which I, which I believe actually help us as practitioners. So I don't think that uh, the only thing that we can do with social media today is to be careful what we put out there. 
uh, and that's the only thing we can possibly do to safeguard our own selves, uh, whether that be from AIs or whether that be from uh, the other uh, nefarious uh, people on uh, social media running around, basically. Okay, uh, thanks. Now, the other question is, does Indian copyright law confer copyright protection to artificial intelligence created literary work? Not at the current moment. It does not. Uh, can it? do it can it be done yes but it would require a change in the law as to who could uh, become an author or who could become an owner of a work have we come across a case such as this today in india no we have not will we do so yes i believe by the increased use of technology or increased use of ai in our practice of law, we could have a possibility of such a matter arising in the very, very near future. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rohadgi, you would like to add something? I totally agree with what Matthew has said and nothing to add right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this question is regarding what do you think is the position about legal personhood of artificial intelligence across the world and in India right now? We have you repeat about that, Do you repeat yeah. that? Uh, the question is, uh, what is the position regarding the legal personhood of artificial intelligence across the world and in India? How is AI considered a positive approach for law? We have talked about some part of it. Matthews, you want to take it? Should I take it? Yep. So uh, I think the biggest benefit of using AI today is the one, uh, it's actually two, one increased efficiency, two, the optimum utilization of time. As a legal practitioner today, time is of paramount importance. We as lawyers have heard of how billing by the hour happens and so on and so forth. What, it, what is it? it? It's time. We bill by the hour, we bill on time, time spent. So the optimum utilization of time for an attorney today is of paramount importance. Clients today require fast service as a service and quality service. As a service provider, I need to be able to utilize all the technology that is there at my fingertips to ensure that I am able to deliver a timely service to my clients in the best manner possible. And as far as I, if I'm sitting from a business perspective is concerned, with the least amount of time spent to ensure that my profit levels are at a high level. So if I take up a project worth 50,000 and I spend time worth almost one lakh, that's a negative of 50,000. So that, that's a loss. So I need to take up something worth 50, for 50,000 and finish the work within a time of maybe, which could be allotted for a 20,000 rupee work, thus making a profit of 30,000. So allocation of time, timely service, quality of work, these are things that clients want today. They, they require it, they demand it of us. And we need to be able to provide that. And for that, technology helps. Technologies like Legit Quest and a whole host of others help us achieve that. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, this is the last question we have. How, according to you, should the existing patent and IP laws be revised and new modes be created to fit the emerging technology? Rohan? So, uh, so I think the first thing that we need to do is in following from the last question is do we recognize uh, these AIs and softwares as legal persons within the existing laws, be it IP laws or be it non-IP laws? So that is, I think, the biggest question that uh, are they recognized as in, as inventors or authors to uh, claim those rights. But the question that arises here is, how does an AI file an infringement suit? You would still need human intervention to really oppose a trademark application or a patent application or file a uh, infringement suit. So uh, AI will always be something which is like Matthew said, assistive in nature. It can't really overtake uh, the humans at this point of time, at least. It's not going to be Terminator 7. So uh, I think uh, what we need in the laws is probably a change to recognize maybe the authorship and the uh, inventorship. Like I mentioned earlier, you can't really have AIs at least 
for the applicable laws to be uh, either owners uh, or uh, owners of patents or uh, copyrights so that will still be uh, a legal entity or or individuals it is assigned to but yes the law would require changes wherever applicable to, rec to recognize for a request uh, someone i think is speaking for a request and just to put the pc on mute thank you uh, so i think yeah, that the law requires firstly to recognize ai as uh, a legal person for us to uh, really change the other uh, parts of the law where yes what happens where uh, where ai analyzes some data and then comes out with new data which gives which uh, really assists us in analyzing uh, let's say a trademark search so does uh, the ai hold the copyright over that new uh, data that's been uh, developed or does the human own it so there are questions which uh, would need a lot of deliberation a lot of discussions to really come up with changes in law over to you mathews yeah so rohan i think you've covered most of it but one thing i would like to add in here is basically this the first thing that we would need is a change in mindset uh i mean uh, we would need a change in mindset as to how we are planning on doing things how we plan to go forward with things and subsequent to that yes like you mentioned a change in a slight tweak in the law i wouldn't say a change i think i would slight tweak in the law would be required uh, a, a case in point is when we started uh, using uh, information technology or it as we get on know about it today uh, today we even admit documents which are uh, there online we, we, it's possible to do it but if you look at it maybe 15 or 20 years ago it was not possible to do that so there has been a tweak in the law as far as acceptance of documents created online are concerned i have seen a lot of discussions regarding the use of softwares like docusign today to sign documents what's the admissibility of such kind of documents a uh, document signed in docusign is it admissible in india today is it as admissible in the trademark registry today so one is a change in mindset which is required and the second is of course the tweaking of the law which we would require to start accepting uh, uh services provided by ai or things done by ai or works created by ai to be able to go forward and both of these happen to be two sides of a coin so one does not work without the other so if there is no change in our perception as to how we look at things we are definitely not going to be requiring law to change or tweak we are, we are, we are ex they happy accepting the status quo but if we change our perception today and say yes let's do this let's let's start adopting these technologies and then let's see what is required in law to be changed or tweak to accept it then we will so be able to be in a position to ask for that change and that change will happen or come so uh till i just want to add on to something that matthew said uh vis a vis evidence there was a very interesting case sometime last year in the us where uh, a murder happened within a family and uh, the police actually uh, used uh, the court sorry used uh, the, the, the there was a siri device within the house and they used the recordings of siri as evidence in the court so uh, that was a very interesting development which i probably heard for the first time because uh, maybe 20 years back uh, even a mobile phone would not have been an, uh, you know admissible in evidence and today we have uh, technologies like siri and uh, alexa which are primarily uh, ai enabled which are being used as uh, evidence in uh, courts so uh, these are interesting developments happening all around and let's see how those uh, you know what changes in law are required thank you okay uh, thanks a lot that was very profound and helpful for all of us and in the end our panelists would like to add something else to this and then we can wrap it up so yeah um in i, I would say tulip in uh, in uh, conclusion what we are looking at is basically A, a drastic change in how we're going to perceive things, a drastic change in how we're going to practice 
law. And that is going to be one of the biggest steps that we're going to take, uh, especially in the field of IP, uh, when we decide to change and adapt uh, AI to our working styles. Uh, we've also already seen changes coming about. We've also seen an expression of interest by the uh, CGDPTM or the Indian IP office. It is now to be seen what are the steps that are going to be taken. I mean, there is someone up there talking about it. There is definitely uh, people who are thinking about it. The next step, I think, would be what, hap what, what are the steps now that are going to be taken to use it, to adapt it, and of course, when we do adapt it, yes, there will be a period of uh, gestation time period wherein or uh, where we would have teething problems. Yes, there would be that definitely. But it is something that the AI is smart enough to overcome. And if taught proper, properly, it is possible to overcome it as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rohadgi, you would like to add something? You know, just to... Uh add on we we are using a lot of ai into our practice today be it softwares like legit quest and other softwares and so is the administration so uh, i think these are interesting times where quality uh, in terms of the examinations the searches and the efficiency is going to improve a lot and in in the end it's it's ai is improving a lot of the uh, mundane tasks. So it's really assisting us in improving our efficiency, improving output, and getting better results in the end. So, uh, like Matthew said, these are interesting times, and AI for the foreseeable future seems to be more of technology than really uh, taking over what uh, humans do. So, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Tulip. Karan and everyone at Legit Quest for having us over and uh, thank you so much. Stay safe and take care. Okay, it was wonderful to have you here and we appreciate you being here and also I would like to thank for all the exceptional insightful views that you gave us and uh, thank you to the attendees also for being here with us and stay safe everyone and kindly subscribe to Legit Quest YouTube channel for this recording. Thank you. Yes, thank you Tulip, thank you Karan okay. and Legit Quest and uh, Rohit, you're here as well. Thank you so much for hosting us. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good evening, guys.